Thank you for joining the Mono County COVID community meeting for May 7th, 2020. My name is Brian Wheeler and I'm from Mono County Public Health. I am once again joined by panelists from Mono County, the town of Mammoth, and Mammoth Hospital. But again, before we get started, I just want to remind our viewers to visit our COVID-19 portal, and that is in English and in Spanish. And that web address is monohealth.com forward slash coronavirus. Again, monohealth.com forward slash coronavirus. So you can visit the site to get the most up-to-date information. You can submit questions in English and Spanish to our information team and get answers. And there's also an FAQ page where many of your questions can be answered. I also want to remind our viewers of the 211 line. If you dial into 211 and choose the correct option, you can speak to a nurse between the hours of 8 and 5, seven days a week. That is also in English and in Spanish. And if you're just seeking information or if you feel that maybe you are sick and want some guidance, I encourage you to reach out to 211. We have a fully packed schedule tonight, and uh, we'll get started in a minute uh, with Chief Freevolt, uh, who's going to be doing a presentation in regards to the roadmap to reopening. And I also want to make sure that everyone knows, all of our viewers, that if you actually go to our portal, you can follow the presentation. You can follow along with, with Frank. So um, let's get it started here. And Frank, you're up. If you want to uh, give us an update on uh, stage two. All right. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, I am going to do my best to cover a, a broad and uh, pretty fluid amount of information, uh, especially during this last week. Um, try to get through this as best I can. And then um, probably more importantly is that we're going to do our best to answer your questions at the conclusion. On Monday of this week, the uh, governor, during his new press release, um, mentioned that on Friday we would well, we'd have several things happen this week. Um, the big ones were that uh, curbside retail and possibly some other uh, what are called low-risk stage two uh, businesses should be able to start operating. We had expected to see some guidelines uh, earlier in the week. Uh, on more, more specific on that. Um, and the, the bulk of those guidelines are going to be, they're delayed now until Tuesday of next week. But um, what we know from the uh, press releases so far this week, and uh, most recently today, is that um, on Friday, um, we will begin entering the, the low risk portions of stage two. And what that means uh, generally are um, retail, curbside uh, pickup, manufacturing that supports uh, retail curbside pickup, um, offices that uh, telework is not really possible, um, some loosening up there, and then more in public spaces. And we don't have a whole lot more detail than, than the ones I just gave you, the descriptions. The other thing that came out this week was the idea that the state public health department recognized that different parts of the state were affected differently uh, and continue to be affected differently by the virus. Um, and there, the, the concept is that there's, you know, there's variance in there from, from one county to the next. And so they, they made some room for the idea that uh, because different parts of the state, different counties have been affected differently, under certain conditions that are still still being finalized, uh, some counties may have the opportunity to uh, file for variance that is uh, attested to uh, by the public health officer. Uh, uh, a hospital, a local hospital, uh, maybe more than one if a place had more than one hospital, uh, and also the board of supervisors for that county. Um, Dr. Boo is actually, he may join us late tonight. He's not with us. He's actually sitting on a meeting right now with um, the California Department of Public Health, and it is related uh, directly to the, this process of uh, testing or attestation, you may hear. 
And so we don't have all the details on that yet. We do believe that we've positioned the county um, with the help of obviously all of you to begin with um, or you know, following public health directives that have come out um, through our community support uh, branch, through the amazing work by the hospital to extend their capacity, um, and then also with public health. Uh, they've done a lot of work to extend their capacity. So we believe that we're, we're in a very good place to make that case. However, those definitions uh, have to be set by the state. I believe the reason they're having the meeting right now is because there were enough questions from the noon conference uh, that they, they needed to huddle up and, and listen to the public health officers. And to their credit, they're, they're doing that. So what that means is that uh, on, on Tuesday of next week, we'll see what, what we hear is that we will see the state's guidelines um, uh, for broad sections of business. We believe it'll be very similar to the guidelines that uh, many of you have been working on with Dr. Boo over the last few weeks. Um, uh, and uh, um, Alicia Benos, who's been heading up our economic recovery branch, I believe those are gonna be very similar. Uh, we won't know that we see them Tuesday, but uh, the preparations and input that you've all been involved in, the discussions, the, the considerations about how you might operate your business under those conditions, um, it's going to be time well spent. So there are four stages um, in the governor's roadmap. Uh, and as I said, we're going to look at entering this stage two at a, at a low risk level. If it turns out um, next week that we qualify to uh, apply for a variance, it would allow us to move through the rest of stage two, but not stage three. Um, stage three uh, at present is des described as higher work, uh, higher risk workplaces. Um, examples would be uh, personal care, hair and nail salons, gyms, etc., entertainment venues, um, movie theaters, um, and then, you know, larger in-service uh, uh, or in-person uh, gatherings. So it would allow us to move through the stage two area under a variance, but not into stage three. The, the guidelines that uh, we have been working on, it, in the absence of anything else showing up before tomorrow, um, my recommendation, uh, I'll talk with Dr. Boo when he gets off the, uh, uh, the meeting that he's on, we'll, we'll discuss it later this evening. So I don't want to get too far ahead of him. But if, if the state doesn't provide anything for us to work on tomorrow, um, under his consultation, my recommendation would be that we um, use the guidelines that we have uh, in hand. And uh, those are pretty, pretty straightforward. If you're trying to get a mental picture of what it looks like, if you've, uh, uh, like me, if you've gone out and uh, uh, done some uh, restaurant pickup, you know, one of your favorite places that's doing that, you call ahead, you know what you want to order, they pull it aside for you, and essentially you you pick it up out front or they, they bring it to you. So uh, that's generally what those would look like. Um, another area that we're preparing for here as we move forward is the, the whole idea that we'll have more movement, um, which is what we're all certainly looking forward to. Uh, and in the process of that, we're also going to have more interaction. So one of the things that we, we certainly want to uh, commend you on for the past and, and beg of you a little bit longer is to follow these, um, just these basic hygiene uh, uh, items of, you know, wearing a mask, um, covering, keeping some distance, washing frequently. And so uh, even as we open up and get more business, it's actually going to be more important uh, that you just, just practice those things. They're, we're kind of gotten used to them now. They're, they're still obviously cumbersome, but we're, uh, we're, we're used to them. I think we can stick with them a little bit longer. We're going to need to. Another challenge will be making sure that we have the right equipment as the business is open. Um, your town and county leaders have committed to uh, provide some support for those things that might be hard to get um, initially. So we've uh, put together some pretty substantial orders for hand sanitizer. Um, and uh, repurposing some surplus uh, um, masks that we have uh, in supply. Well, we'll still need to leave some reserve uh, for emergency services, uh, hospital care workers, uh, et cetera. Um, we do understand that those may be hard to find at the start and uh, they do want to uh, redirect those, some of the, to those to local business. 
And at this point, um, we don't, as again, we don't, I, Dr. Booth said he was going to try to join us a little bit uh, late from the meeting. In, in the meantime, he uh, graciously allowed uh, Brian Wheeler to uh, field questions for him. And so what I'd like to do here is pivot over to uh, Brian and let him discuss uh, Dr. Booth's covering order just a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, I'm in the hot seat tonight. Um, so on April 30th, Dr. Boo, our health officer, uh, put forth an order requiring face coverings while in public spaces or interacting with people outside of our, our family units. Um, the order is issued in preparation for Governor Newsom's modified statewide stay-at-home orders that are, well, coming out often and frequently. Um, there is detailed information regarding face covers, including English and Spanish business flyers that you can find on our um, online site. That's monohealth.com forward slash coronavirus. And we also encourage the community to join our online community to share your favorite mask styles, coverings, tricks, and uh, do-it-yourself tips at our hashtag cover up mono campaign. Also, if you're an individual who has a health concern regarding wearing a mask, that could be asthma or some kind of breathing issue, uh, I would ask that you actually call 211 and choose the option to speak to a, a nurse and uh, we can give you advice there. Um, also, you know, when you're wearing the mask, um, there's been a lot of conversation about not having to wear the mask if I'm out hiking or bicycling. And that's true if you're alone, but if you come in contact with other individuals, you really need to put that face covering on, at least for that temporary encounter as you pass by each other. Um, and that's really all I have on the masks. So Frank, I think it's back to you and Alicia for some business topics, correct? Correct. And uh, Alicia also was not able to join us tonight. She has a, a very full calendar tomorrow. Uh, we'll be on some meetings um, uh, with her related to the, kind of the final stages of the, the interaction that we've had between public health care orders that we put in place to protect our community and our visitors. And then also trying to find the way to make those as, as least obtrusive as possible to the people that have to run the businesses um, I've said it before, running a business is a challenge on the best of days and we're, you know, out of necessity uh, due to the COVID-19 virus, we're having to put in these, um, you know, these interruptions, these disruptions to the way people would normally go about um, running their businesses and it's a challenge. But Dr. Boo has been spending um, a lot of time uh, directly uh, in Zoom meetings with people, reviewing, I think we surpassed the 200 point mark on uh, uh, comments and feedback to those that we've tried to integrate in. And then tomorrow will be uh, um, a day to, to uh, wrap that up in a series of uh, Zoom meetings at the, uh, at the countywide level. And then uh, I'll let Dan address later. I believe he's also got an early morning um, meeting as well that uh, uh, may be related to uh, business as well, but I'll let him pick that up in a couple of minutes. Um, so essentially the thing, the biggest thing I think that uh, Alicia wanted me to pass along for her was first of all, uh, a tremendous amount of thanks um, for all the work that has been uh, done with people assigned to uh, the economic branch with her, um, all of whom are, are direct or indirect business owners, uh, uh, chamber members. Um, uh, there was a lot of work done early uh, directly to help business owners in you know, applying for loans and just understanding the, you know, the, the maze of bureaucracy that comes with those things. Um, generating a, a, a good survey for us to have a better understanding of where people are at. That's something we've used to manage to. She was also certainly very uh, thankful to Dr. Boo for uh, uh, spending the time and, and effort that he has, uh, which has been substantial um, in just trying to get a, a narrower gap between what we've got to do to protect our community and ourselves and yet try to get us back to business um, as soon as we can. We're tourism economy, that's, that's how the place works. So those are probably the high points I have to share um, on Alicia's back. 
Thank you, Frank. I'm now going to ask Dan Holler to speak uh, in regards to uh, Town Rental Assistance Program. Dan. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have established a rental assistance program for the Town of Mammoth Lakes and the portion of it even into Mono County, I believe, at this point. The program is being administered by Mammoth Lakes Housing. If you go to their website, which is mammothlakeshousing.org, you click on the resources tab and it'll pop up and there will be a, a new rental assistance program. The program is currently set up to offer up to $500 uh, for rental assistance. Uh, currently you can apply twice, uh, for two different months of rental assistance. The rental assistance is then paid directly to your landlord uh, so that it goes to that and it's credited against any rent that you may owe at that point or to offset the coming month rent. Uh, the, the application is relatively short. We have gotten a lot of them in, well over 100 to date. Uh, we are processing them and getting checks out a couple times a week. Uh, so we're trying to move that out in the community pretty quickly. Uh, again, go to mammothlakeshousing.org, uh, click on the resources tab in the rental assistance program and you will find applications there. If you just need a paper application, come by the town offices and they're available uh, by our front door, which is uh, just up above Giovanni's. Thank you, Dan. I believe that gives us the opportunity now to move to some questions. Can we have our first question, please? In what phase do you expect to reopen short-term rentals? And is there a timeline slash date to start allowing short-term rentals? Uh, Dan, can you talk about short-term rentals in the town? Yeah, the short, in the town level, it looks like there was a little confusing in part of the roadmap. It looked like there could be some hospitality items in stage two, but I believe most of the hospitality and lodging components are identified in stage three of the governor's opening plan. Uh, so that would be out a little further, and we do not have a hard date at this point uh, for when that will be available. Thank you, Dan. Can we have our next question? The governor said it's up to the counties. Why do you keep saying it's up to the governor? Chief Revolt, can you take that question for me? Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. We, it, it is true. We are not, as a county, allowed to uh, generally do anything less restrictive uh, than a state, and that's true for any county in any state. The specific uh, Thing that we that Governor Newsom is considering and, and put in his uh, uh, executive order as of Monday this week, I believe it was, the governor directed his public health officer for the state to create a process where counties could uh, request for variance of the state's guidance under a, pro a process of, I hate this word, it's, it's a testing to the fact that you have the capability to move through um, all of stage two, not stage three. So it's, it's, it's permission to move ahead of the state's requirements with qualifications and conditions. Um, if you wanna see his exact words, you can look at the, uh, there's good YouTube on his, uh, uh, his press conference today. I listened to it twice just to make sure I understood exactly what he was saying. So, um, the governor is allowing a process for variance at the county level. If we have that opportunity, I have every confidence we're going to pursue it. Um, the guidelines for that will come out next Tuesday. But as I said earlier, Dr. Boo is in unsure what are spirited discussions just now on the criteria for a county to qualify to go through that process. Thank you, Chief. We have our next question. What metrics, that is number, not the go-ahead from the governor, are being considered for opening up and more importantly, shutting down in the future if a surge occurs? For example, how many new COVID hospitalizations per week in Mono County can you tolerate? And what is the minimum amount of beds that needs to be available? We are concerned that no real data-driven metrics are being seriously looked at. Please figure these out now and share them with us. This will help us all keep an eye on numbers and anticipate mitigating actions by the county so we can plan accordingly. Dr. Burroughs, are you available? I am. Um, that's, a, 
That's a tough answer to give. Uh, I can tell you that we are looking at data-driven metrics. Back in, I want to say the end of March, about the third week of March, we that's where we realized our uh, what, what I'm going to call our surge, where we had a total of five patients that went through the hospital system, none of them all at the same time, but three of them were very sick. They wound up um, being on life support systems where they had a breathing tube in their airway. We had one patient in the hospital and another patient that was actually managed as an outpatient. Um, I think based on that experience, we feel like if we were to have five patients with active COVID related disease in the hospital all at once, that would be a trigger to us to say, we have too much of this disease in our area, either related to Mona County residents or as a result of visitors and opening back up. So right now, and that's even that number is in flux to some extent based on what the patient is dealing with. That's our, our number to start to, to look at that, put the brakes on, have a discussion with Dr. Boo in public health in conjunction with myself and other people in the hospital and decide if this is a bigger community-wide or population-wide problem than we feel we can handle to allow things to continue to stay open. Dr. Burroughs, can you just uh, clarify the current state of the hospital? Yeah, the current state of the hospital on a traffic light basis is green. Uh, red, yellow, and green. So green means that we have no limitations whatsoever. We can take care of anyone that walks in the door right now that needs to be taken care of. Uh, I'm going to qualify that and say that does not mean that you wouldn't transfer because we are a critical access hospital. So our natural business model is if we feel you need a higher level of care for whatever reason, we're still going to transfer you out. That does not mean we're going to transfer you out because we just don't know what we're doing and how we can take care of this. It has everything to do with our location and the need for additional resources. Yellow means that we're kind of approaching that area I just talked about where we now have several patients in the hospital with active COVID disease, approaching that number of five where we're going to start to look at it. Red means that we are now at crisis capacity. Um, our hospital right now is equipped to be a 17 bed facility. We have plans in place right now that we could accommodate as many as 40 and possibly even 60 patients if we had to. But that is very much a crisis level of care where we are now scrambling for beds, staff, and decision making on who gets what because we don't have enough resources to care for everybody as if there were no limitations on what resources were available. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Chief, I believe you wanted to add something to this conversation. Chief? Sorry, I'm just <laughs> looking for the mute button. button. <laughs> 100 more Zoom meetings than I've ever done. Uh, it's an excellent question, and, and to, to make the point, one of the requirements to uh, qualify for variance, you have to submit a plan that includes exactly the, the point that you made, trigger points at which your county would begin to then uh, reinstitute certain mitigations or certain um, actions to contain the spread. So it's an excellent question, and it is actually a requirement uh, if we were to pursue a variance. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Dr. If I, could, if I could add, Brian, um, sure. Dr. Boo and I and the hospital and everyone in this committee are going to be working to create that a testing um, format that we have to we have to submit in order to move forward. This is not going to be something that is just a yes or no go. It's going to have to be provide evidence that you are ready to go and what resources you have and what your triggers are to pull back. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, chief. Next question, please. Positive cases just went up the last two days after a lull. Should we be concerned? Dr. Burroughs, I'd ask you to field that question. I'm sorry, could you just answer one more time? Positive cases just went up the last two days after a lull. Should we be concerned? So this is part of the complicated part of the answer. Um, we are going to see this more and more now as this disease state becomes more prominent throughout not only our county and our state, but across the nation and if not the world. 
Um, one of the things that you're going to see are people that are going to test positive long after they are actively infected. And it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to sort out who's truly got an infection or medical issues related to the fact that they test positive versus they're not actively infected, but they are testing positive because at some point they were exposed and whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. So that number becomes very cloudy to try to understand what that means. Um, I, I, the example I would give you is think in terms of what we can do with forensic medicine where you're doing DNA sampling, when you're trying to figure out a murder mystery, for example. The DNA is still on the person that may have been buried 50 years ago. That doesn't mean you can't go back and find the DNA evidence to then try to solve the mystery. Kind of the same thing with testing for COVID. Um, you can sample someone's throat and identify evidence that the virus was there. It does not mean the virus is alive. Um, and you have to now take into account what is the person presenting with as the reason you're doing the testing at all. And right now, our policy in the hospital is to test everyone that gets admitted. And the biggest reason for that is to try to keep our areas in the hospital separate, where we have patients in what we consider our COVID positive zone, and then we have patients in our COVID negative zones. And we're trying very hard not to be a vector of that spread where someone comes into the hospital or staff is taking care of that person. And we're now putting people at risk of getting infected simply because of who you're taking care of. Thank you, Dr. Burroughs. And, and I like that analogy. Um, next question, please. Our grocery store workers are being harassed and bullied by people who don't believe they should be required to wear a face covering. This will only get much worse as we expect to see more out of town visitors. Can the town or other governing bodies help? Perhaps an official sign or poster placed at entries of these establishments explaining the order. Our essential workers deserve something to be done. They're already going way above and beyond normal duties. Thank you. Chief. So a couple parts to the question. One, it's yet yeah, disconcerting to, to hear that. And, and that kind of, uh, that kind of behavior, it's, it's not from our local folks. Um, that's the kind of behavior that makes us kind of hedge a little bit when we're talking about these you know, gray areas. Hey, what, what can we do? How hard can we push? Um, that kind of behavior is an example of, unfortunately, we, we don't have control over what people bring in the way of manners. Um, if you've lived here a long time, we all understand that. Um, so specifically, um, obviously, if anybody ever feels uh, threatened, uh, seriously, certainly call law enforcement. I'm sure Deep Chief Davis will have someone there in a hot minute to take care of that. So we don't want to let things uh, escalate uh, past that. Um, in, in association with Dr. Boo's uh, uh, recent order on face covering, there uh, was also, uh, I don't think, uh, yeah, Stu was on the call with us. Maybe he can address that. But we had talked about having a, a consistent signage uh, that would be available for people to put up um, in and around their uh, uh, stores and places of business. Um, Stu, if you're on, can you, can you speak to that? Yes, thank you, Chief. So I just wanted to remind everybody that um, we have developed uh, these uh, business posters and they're available on the uh, portal uh, under the business tab. So you can go in there and download uh, eight and a half by 11 poster that basically states that this uh, business requires a face covering to enter. Um, so we encourage all our business um, owners across the county to visit our portal, download that flyer and post it on every entrance of their, of their, amended, of their uh, establishment. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. Good to see you. Can we get our next question, please? The Board of Supervisors met Tuesday and have a special meeting tomorrow to deliberate on requesting the governor to allow our county to move past current state restrictions, including consideration of opening fishing and lodging May 15th or May 22nd. The members of this call support that and can this still happen? Uh, Bob Lawton, are you on the call and able to address that? Hi, Brian. Um, and I, I apologize for trying to, to be in multiple places at once. Um, could you repeat the question, please? 
The Board of Supervisors met Tuesday and have a special meeting tomorrow to deliberate on requesting the governor to allow our county to pass current state restrictions, including consideration of opening fishing and lodging May 15th or May 22nd. Do the members of this call support that and can this still happen? Okay, well, thanks very much for that question. The, um, the board has a special meeting scheduled for tomorrow at 1 p.m. to take this issue up um, and to prepare the wording of a, uh, of a, of a, a formal request from the board to the governor and the, um, and the state's health officer to have, the, uh, have uh, Mono County recognized as having a, uh, a rather unique situation with respect to um, the tourism and, uh, and our success so far in addressing the COVID outbreak. Um, to be clear, what would be proposed is a, uh, um, a, a, a variance or a revision by the governor and, the, and, the, and, uh, and state public health to the conditions required for Mono County to advance to a, to a, uh, a more in-depth uh, part of phase two. Um, there are a few things that need to be considered, including um, access to testing, including uh, the recent history of COVID cases, the governor's current requirements um, specify uh, one COVID case diagnosed per 10,000 residents in the last 14 days. And at a minimum, um, our, uh, our population size and our status as a small county creates a real statistical imbalance when compared with other counties of 40,000, 70,000, or upwards of a million residents. So the board's going to be discussing that. Um, I anticipate that they will provide um, direction to staff on the, on the uh, execution and transmittal of, uh, of a formal request to the governor for, uh, for special consideration. But I want to be clear that I don't believe the board is going to recommend that we act on our own to, um, to go beyond the scope of what's permitted. What we're trying, what we're going to bring to the board is a recommendation that they discuss getting the, uh, the state to modify, to further modify the concessions recently announced by the governor. Uh, obviously, we've got a whole different set of, uh, of uh, criteria and, and, and uh, um, requirements that will be released, I believe, on Tuesday, as has been previously noted. And with any luck, those will um, make further action unnecessary. But the board is the board is going to, I believe, uh, engage very strongly and very firmly on uh, on stating our case to the governor. And uh, although I'm not privy to what the discussions are that Dr. Boo is having at the state level, um, I do believe that the uh, uh, such a request from the Board of Supervisors for further modifications to the state um, requirements. I believe that that request will also have the support of the county's public health officer. Thank you, CAO Lawton. And uh, just as a reminder, it's just past the top of the hour, so we have 26 minutes left to field some more questions. Do we want to go to the phone line for a question? Sure. First caller is CM. Go ahead and unmute yourself. CM, are you there? All right, moving on to the next caller. Next caller is Greg Vane. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, I wanted to follow up on a question that came a little bit earlier in our town hall about dealing with, Hi, can you guys hear me? We hear you, Greg. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm following up on a question uh, that you guys fielded a little bit ago 
about protecting our critical workers for especially those who work in the groceries uh, who are taking a lot of who take flack from a few not a lot but from a few people in my experience who are determined that they don't have to wear a face mask my impression and the impression of many of my friends who are with whom i speak by phone almost every day or zoom with them i rarely leave my house uh, is that by and large our community mono and mammoth has really come together behind Dr. Boo's directive, and I think it's a fairly small number of people who are doing this. The bigger concern that most of us have is with the influx of folks who will be coming from out of town when we do open uh, the, you know, the town and the county to visitors. And we all have seen the stories about beaches in Southern California, Yuba County, Sutter County, and so forth. So a question that I have for, for you guys in the Unified Command is, have you considered what your response will be if you start hearing more and more stories about people who are absolutely refusing to wear the facial, the facial mask in spite of the directories, the, the directives which say that it's mandatory. Now I'm thinking Governor Newsom closed the beaches in Southern California, didn't completely keep everybody off, but it dramatically reduced the number of people who were you know, breaking the law. So the, it's a broad question for the United Command to, to think about, have you been thinking about how you will deal with that? If we get a large influx of folks who are just saying, to heck with you guys, I'm in the mountains, I'm an American, I can do whatever I want to do. How will you deal with that? Chief Rebold, can you handle that question for us? I'll give it my best shot. Um, so it's a great question. Uh, and, and obviously we have no shortage of examples of, of you know, large groups of people choosing to behave badly. Um, so that's, you know, that's a real possibility. Uh, however, I've, I've said it a number of times, I'm gonna repeat it here. We're not gonna enforce our way through this uh, incident successfully. We, we got to this spot by um, making the case, um, you know, a, a, appealing to people to, to protect themselves and others we, we did take some drastic measures at the start uh, to essentially um, shut down short-term um, occupancy because if there's no place to stay there's really not much you can do and uh, I, I believe we're going to be able to handle most of these with you know um, influence education uh, hopefully good example here you know if we collectively can can provide a good example to, for people to model on when they get here I mean I'd like to feel someone I'd like someone to feel odd if, if they're the only one in Vaughn's when they show up without a mask or, or you know, some other place. We want them to be the, uh, the outsider and people kind of like to act like they're locals here. So let's give them a good example. Um, but I have every confidence if we run across egregious violations of public health orders, um, I'm sure we'll deal with them. You know, I'm not going to step in the way of uh, law enforcement on how and uh, when and where they may do that, but they've exercised great judgment in the past and I'll trust it in the future. Thank you, Chief. Ingrid, would you like to add to that, Sheriff sure, Brown? I, I would, thank you. So, so far we have not issued any citations, but these public health orders do have the force of law. It is a misdemeanor to violate them and we can cite you and you can talk your way into a ticket or you can act your way into a ticket. We will start with an education piece, get for voluntary compliance, but if somebody stands their ground and insists that they want to violate that public health order, then they can get a citation for it. And it's a spendy one. So it might just take a couple of people to get those citations if that's what it comes to. But so far we have not had to do that. We are in our eighth week of this and we have not had to issue a single citation. So sure, people could come up and they could be jerks, but one jerk gets a ticket, the other jerks usually learn from that. So I'm really hopeful that we can go for the education part. Thank you, Sheriff Braun. I believe Dr. Burroughs would like to add to this conversation. Yeah, I was gonna say from a health perspective, you're not gonna to have to enforce it at all. Um, we think it's hard to get to phase two right now. We're having a petition and a test and say all these things that we're doing and what we're ready for. You think it's hard to get to phase two? It's gonna be really hard to get to phase three if we're not compliant. So this is very much going to be a we're going to sink together or swim together type of phenomenon. And if all of us, and I mean community members and county members and state and visitors from out of state, don't comply, 
it's, it's really going to take care of itself. We're going to have to ratchet down because we are not going to pass that next test to move on to the next phase, which is what everybody wants. Thank you, Dr. Burrows. All right, how about our next caller? Our next caller is Miss Rowan. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Leah Roman, go ahead and unmute yourself. I just want to say thank you, Dr. Dr. Burroughs, for that comment. Thank you, Leah. Did you have any questions or just, just the comment? Well, looks like we lost Leah, so go ahead with the next caller. That is our last call-in caller. Uh, can you okay. Sorry, I'll go to the next question. Sure. Can you provide specific guidelines on gatherings? We are entering a season of barbecues, tailgating parties, weddings, etc. For example, in June are gatherings of 10 to 20 people okay? You can use social distancing guidelines. There are 40 people, 50 people. Groups and gatherings are going to happen. Without specific guidelines, people will unknowingly be breaking the rules. Good question. Chief Freebolt, can you take that question for us? I've not actually seen, I know you've been discussing the re-entry to gatherings with Dr. Boo um, at length. Um, I know he's been, um, uh, he's great at looking at other areas. Um, there's a whole range of things we've looked at where we've compared to other areas. So I, I hesitate to give a, uh, a specific number without him here. Um, I do know that they, they were in the range of the same kinds of numbers when we first got started into this. If you remember, um, we went from really no limits other than typical fire codes and that types of things on, on occupancies. And the group numbers, you know, went from, you know, very large down to, you know, I believe it was a couple hundred and I think it went to 50 and then 10 and then we were down to just complete isolation. So um, without getting ahead of Dr. Boo on the specifics, um, you could expect it to go back in kind of a, a, a similar fashion. Thank you, Chief Rebo. How about our next question? Why won't the rental assistant assistance help long-term residents without a 12-month lease. Many rentals do not have leases. Dan, are you yeah. there? Yes, if I may. Uh, I believe the application they're looking at is an old one. Uh, the current requirement is that they just have to be working in the region, uh, basically in Mono County, for a minimum of the three months prior to March 19th. So that they are already here and employed and then we're impacted by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so there is no uh, long-term requirement at this point. So the current applications, again, are on the mammothlakes.org website. Thank um, you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Housing. Next question, please. I am noticing a small store in South County not asking their customers to wear a mask. I'm very concerned as a high-risk person. How can the situation be improved? Uh, Chief Rebolt, can you uh, field that question for us? So the, first of all, um, you can always remind the person when you go in if they, uh, you know, if they don't have a mask on, it's okay to politely, you know, remind and ask people if they, if they could mask up. Um, I don't know if you have the choice for any other stores if they choose not to. Um, and again, without Dr. Uh, Boo present, I don't want to get um, at ahead of him on his, uh, his mask order. I don't, I don't know that it actually would apply in that setting. Brian, are you more familiar with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to get ahead of Dr. Boo either. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, they can certainly call us to report the situation and, and we can certainly follow up or or have environmental health go out there and uh, provide some education that is, that is always an option. Hey, if I may, Brian, this is Dan. Uh, 
the masks are required, but we don't have anything, I believe, in the ordinance that requires a uh, owner to tell people to wear a mask. Uh, there is a requirement that people wear one, but not that a shop owner, to my knowledge, would be required to tell people to put one on. So it would be a voluntary element by the shopkeeper if uh, they wish to tell people. If they don't have masks and they need something so they can hand out, then they should contact uh, uh, one of us and uh, we can make sure that they have some uh, masks available, you know, to be able to hand out to people who come in without one. Thank you for clarification, Dan. How about our next question? Frank, did you want to add? Yeah, thank you. Just real quick. Also, uh, I may have mentioned it at the beginning, I, I don't recall, but the uh, uh, town and the county have committed to uh, provide at least an initial set of masks to businesses uh, in the town and the county to get them started. So um, uh, once we get those distributed out, that you know, there shouldn't be an issue of not, you know, having something. And at this point, uh, between Dr. Burroughs' examples and a bunch of other people on how you can make some face coverings, um, it's really not a whole lot of excuses, I think, left for not having some way to cover up. And then just a point of information, the number for our emergency operations center is 760-932-5650. How about our next question? Okay, this one's a doozy. As of 5-6-2020, the Mono County Health Department reported 276 COVID-19 tests had been administered. According to Google, as, as of 2018, Mono County has an estimated population of 14,000 people. If one test were administered to the one county citizen, this would equal 1.94% of the total population, less than 2%. Question one, of the 276 tests administered, how many patients were tested once with no follow-up or secondary test? Two, if healthcare workers and previous positive patients have received multiple tests, which I, they should, it makes the actual number of county residents tested even lower than the aforementioned 2%. What is the percentage of Mono County population tested if we exclude duplicate tests? Three, given that less than 2% of the county's population has been tested and despite shelter in place and mandatory mask etiquettes, we're still seeing new cases coming in. How do you justify any part of reopening the county to tourists, let alone locals, given the lack of testing and true knowledge of what the virus is doing within the community? You yourself said to expect a spike in numbers when we reopen, but we're actually ready to, are we actually ready to reopen in any capacity, given less than 2% of the population has been tested. I'm eager to get back to work. I know the keep, keeping things closed is suffocating our town, but I really think these issues need to be honestly and directly addressed to the community. Dr. Burroughs, can you uh, field that question for us? I will do my best. Um, so the answer as far as testing the entire population, if you go back to when this all started, the initial initiative, the, the very first emphasis was let's contain it. So theoretically, test everybody. And anyone that tests positive, you're going to isolate. And then contacts are going to quarantine. Reality is we do not, did not, and will not have enough tests to do that. Uh, maybe at some point we'll be able to test everybody, but the reality is we don't. So that put us in a situation where we decided we had to reserve our tests for the people that we had a suspicion for. Um, patients would present with, with headache or loss of, taste of, loss of taste and smell, or they would have difficulty breathing or a new onset cough, or they would be in contact with somebody that was known to test positive, and then tracers would go out through public health to identify those people and test them, and then in turn quarantine them. That we do have enough tests for. Um, and I'm going to say this again, and it still holds very true. If you have new onset of symptoms where you have fever, shortness of breath, or cough, or you're in contact with someone that's positive, your first responsibility is, in fact, to quarantine yourself, not expose other people. Uh, if you call the 211 hotline, you can ask for resources. We have things in place right now as far as 
being able to put you up in a location where you can isolate from the rest of your family or roommates or close contacts so you don't get them all sick. So those are all very much in place with the goal of trying to control this from a population standpoint with the resources not only that we have, but, they, but this is a worldwide problem. Globally, we do not have enough tests to be able to test everybody. As far as the people that have tests, so the, the population question that you asked, um, you can't look at it that way. Yes, from an absolute standpoint, we have tested whatever you said, 2% of the county population. But the reality is we're reserving those tests for the people that we have a higher level of suspicion for. So you can't make a jump in, in, in logic to say, we have only tested X number of people and we don't, we don't know what to do with that. We know what we can do with the people that we are suspicious of, and we've been very good at identifying those people and testing them and then confirming either they're positive or negative. Um, of the people that have been tested, and I believe that number right now is about, is 27 for the county that have tested positive, uh, we are not making it a point to retest them. And the reason for that is because you can have this, this infection, uh, you can continue to test positives, I talked about for one of the other callers, and then even weeks later, you could still potentially test positive because all the test is doing is looking for the genetic material of the virus, what we call the RNA, which is kind of the same as DNA for people, that identifies that the virus was there. It does not tell us if that is a live virus or a dead virus. We have to go on symptoms and we have to go on the clinical presentation of when that person presented. So if you presented with two days of symptoms and we test you, I feel pretty confident telling you you have active virus. If you test positive four weeks after maybe you remember having something, I feel pretty confident telling you don't have live virus. Um, what has been identified and established from a research perspective, at least right now, and again, I'm gonna emphasize, this is all subject to change. We have not been able to culture the virus. So you have to have live virus in order to, to grow it in, in a lab more than 10 days out from when you initially tested positive. For that reason, if you are 10 days out with no fever for three days and no symptoms for three days, we have every reason to believe that you are no longer not only infectious, but you are over the infection. Um, for all of those reasons, and I'm sorry I'm rambling a little bit, that's why we feel confident that we have enough resources to identify the people that are at highest risk, test them, isolate them if they're positive, quarantine them if they're at risk or they came in contact with somebody so they don't spread it to other people. Thank you, Dr. Burrows. Looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Lake Tahoe is asking Newsom to allow them to open now. Do we really want to continue to see our town and local people, businesses suffer? As for curbside shopping, what is different than what we are already doing? Chief Revolt, can you uh, address that, please? Sounds like a, a couple parts in there. Um, I believe that Mono County is actually also asking Governor Newsom uh, to consider their case to reopen, as uh, Bob Lawton mentioned just uh, um, a few minutes ago, that uh, I believe their intent tomorrow, uh, and I'll be at that meeting, is to present some kind of a request to the governor uh, for consideration of, of our ability to um, open further into stage two. Parallel with that request, um, will be, and as I mentioned, Dr. Boo is not with us. He's sitting in on a meeting now that I know is directly related to the conditions for uh, a request for variance uh, based on the, the governor's order to create that kind of a program. So uh, right now I'd say we actually have two parallel initiatives that are very, very close. One is political, one is uh, public health driven um, to seek to have the county open up with conditions that we discussed here. We need to be able to um, manage uh, the uptick in cases that can happen with increased interaction. Um, there was a second part of your question and I apologize, I forgot the second part. <laughs> Lauren, do you remember the, the second part to that, that question? Can you explain the difference of curbside shopping and what we're doing now? 
Right. So the governor's order um, allowed some businesses to open um, at the time they were deemed, uh, they were making a determination of essential versus non-essential. Uh, so we've had some businesses open under these, underneath those conditions. Uh, for the, for the non-essential businesses, uh, the governor's office then redefined non-essential in terms of high and low risk, relative levels of, of high and low risk. In stage two, which is what um, he advised would begin tomorrow, um, it would allow um, low risk businesses, which we talked about as being um, curbside retail. In other words, you don't just go into the store and uh, if it's a non-essential business, um, you don't go in and um, you know, try on clothes or those types of things. Um, so the, the curbside and other uh, low risk stage two businesses um, would open tomorrow based on their being um, within stage two, those lower risk categories. That's probably the best I can explain it. Thank you, Chief. How about our next question? Some folks have been advertising a June 1st opening of campgrounds, hotels, and fishing. Is this accurate? Chief, I'm going to ask you again to, uh, to handle that question. Right. Let's see if I can stick with it. <clears throat> First of all, is, you know, I, is it accurate that they're advertising that? I, I'd, I'd have to see the, the advertising. Is the advertising consistent with the current um, uh, rules and limitations? Um, as I understand it from the county side, and Dan can correct me if I've got this wrong, um, I believe our short-term uh, rental restriction um, has a, an expiration of uh, the 31st. Um, of this month. However, uh, that was self-imposed early to help us get, remember, we needed to shrink um, the county back to base population as fast as possible so that we give Dr. Burroughs and his team, um, you know, a chance to, to get caught up with the cases that they had uh, um, and then build surge capacity um, for, for cases that were coming. So we self-imposed that um, to protect ourselves and our community. The governor uh, for short-term uh, rental in general, that's a stage three allowance. So um, that's about as far as I'm gonna take it is, is that the, uh, for the, for the town, at least the short-term rental expiration is the 31st. That could happen and the governor still may not have us enter into stage three. Dan, do you wanna pick it up from there? Yeah, I believe that is correct. So there are some advertisements out there for June, but unless the governor makes a modification, some of those, they may need to be uh, canceled. Uh, as far as fishing opener goes, I'm not sure if Ingrid has more information on that, but that's under the state purview, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, I believe, Ingrid, for fishing. So fishing is still on hold. It's uh, there's, I think there's a set end date. I'm not sure when it is. They began the May, but it could be extended. Um, we don't have anything on that yet. It would take the three counties that it applies to, which is Alpine, Inyo, and Mono, to petition the state to have it released earlier. Thank you. Thank you. And Brian, if I could just add one more thing. You sure can. You're the chief. <laughs> um, you know, the, the rules, the dates, we, we to, to the best of our ability, we understand that they're just absolutely choking out our economy. We understand that. The only thing that would be worse is if we opened up, you know, a week, two weeks early, and then had to do all of this all over again. That's the only thing that could be worse. So it's a, um, it, it's a terrible, predicament for all of us to be in. Um, we're getting close. I, I believe we're getting close. I, I know darn well that um, Dr. Boo is pushing things. You know, I, I, my phone keeps going off like a disco ball until about 1130 every night when he's, you know, sending off um, updates to things. Um, and then it cranks up again about five in the morning. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in the background to ride this very fine balance between minimizing the economic damage that everybody's suffering from and keeping us from shooting our own foot off by opening up uh, too quick and then having to go through this again. And I, 
I'm sorry it's that way, but I don't know how else to describe it. It is what it is without my permission or quite honestly yours. Thank you, Chief. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this evening. But remember, if you still have questions, and I see we still have questions in our queue, you can email them to our information team or check out our FAQ page and see if it's on there. So until next week, take care of yourselves and each other.